We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today, if you want to open your Bibles there. Acts chapter 2. We're going to be here in Acts chapter 2 for at least the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, Lots to see uh, here um, in our text. All right, Acts chapter 2, and uh, I'm just going to jump right in. We'll get right to work. I got 50 pounds put in a 25-pound sack. I say that like it's something new, Um, but uh, here we go. All right, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I'm going to stop myself right here. Let's pray. Father, (laughs) pour out your spirit, we pray. Just as we're going to read about you pouring out your Holy Spirit, would you now pour out your Holy Spirit upon us? You promised, Lord Jesus, that your spirit would lead us into all truth. You promised, Lord, that, uh, that your spirit would be uh, another of the same kind, God himself, just as you, Jesus, God himself in the flesh. You ascended into heaven. You promised to send to us the Holy Spirit. And so now we thank you and praise you and we pray that your spirit would in fact lead us into all truth, that your spirit would empower us not only to comprehend the truth of your word, but to be doers of your word and to put feet on our faith. And we pray it in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. Amen. All right, now let's read it. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, Acts chapter two, verse one, they were all with one accord in one place. By the way, the one accord, one place, where was this one place? We don't know. Some people think, well, gosh, they're waiting in the upper room where they enjoyed the the Passover meal with Jesus, and this is where they are all assembled and gathered. Uh, It could be that. Um, Some people think that, you know, as we'll read through Acts chapter 2 in in the coming weeks, we're going to see that uh, they were in the the temple courts, uh, gathered together from house to house and in the temple courts. Some people assert, well, they were in the temple courts when this went down, and when we read about the Spirit being poured out and and, uh, and moving miraculously through the people. We'll see that today and how all the people around saw it and they were responding to it and marveling at it that uh, them being in the temple courts would make sense because it would be very public. We just don't know, but they're all together in one place and suddenly, verse two, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and so that's a clue, right? They're, oh, they're in a house They're sitting in a house. Um, Then, verse three, there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Here's the thing. When when we come now to the second chapter of uh, of Acts, what we see, we're gonna see the birth of the church here. We're gonna see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit And it's useful at this point for us to keep in mind that this is part of a two-volume set, just as we've seen. Uh, Luke is the author of the book of Acts. He's also the author of the Gospel of Luke. And um, and in this two-volume set, Luke does a really good job of highlighting the significance of the role of the Holy Spirit. We see in Luke's Gospel, specifically in chapters three and four, that Luke emphasizes the Spirit's role in Jesus' ministry. Uh, We see the baptism of Jesus and the Holy Spirit descending upon him in Luke chapter three, and then we get into Luke chapter four and we see Jesus beginning his ministry in the Galilee region in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we come here to Acts chapter one and two, (coughs) <coughs> and Luke emphasizes the Spirit's role in our life and in our ministry, so to speak. We see Jesus promising the power of the Holy Spirit to his disciples uh, and ultimately to us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And then we see uh, in, here in Acts chapter 2, now what we're seeing is the outpouring of that promised uh, Holy Spirit in power verse 2, in purity in verse 3, and in promise in verse 4, and also in verse 11 as we're going to unpack that. Now, here's the significance of that. The significance about that and why it should matter to you is that a lot of times when we think about the person and the work of Jesus, we can fall into this trap of thinking, well, yeah, Jesus was fully obedient to God because he's God. 
Right? I mean, it's easy for him. He's God. And so when the Bible commands you and me to, to be perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect, when the Bible, Jesus said that, when, when the Bible commands us that we're to obey God, there's a part of us that goes, well, that's not fair. Because Jesus, yeah, he's God. Of course he could do it. I'm not God. I don't know that I can do it. And I think the significance for us here is that we need to understand that Jesus' obedience to the Father was lived out, hear this, it was lived out in spirit-empowered humanity. Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. And as a man, Jesus himself was empowered by the same Holy Spirit that empowers you and that empowers me. That's an important thing for us to keep in mind. Bruce Ware, in his book, The Man Christ Jesus, he writes this. He says, Jesus came as the second Adam, the seed of Abraham, the son of David, and, he goes on to say, he lived his life, obeyed the Father, resisted temptation, and so fulfilled his calling, all in the power of the Holy Spirit who was upon him. And so this chapter that we're reading here, it's a powerful reminder of the transformative power of the Holy Spirit and the vital role that he plays in our life. I like what John Stott said in his commentary. He said, without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship would be unthinkable, even impossible. There can be no life without the life giver, no understanding without the spirit of truth, no fellowship without the unity of the spirit, no Christ-likeness of character apart from his fruit and no effective witness without his power. As a body without breath is a corpse, so the church without the Holy Spirit is dead. I love that quote. Now, in order for us to understand the significance of the event that we're reading about here, Pentecost, um, we need to understand how Pentecost fits in and um, corresponds to all of the, the, the Jewish feasts. God established seven Jewish fe feasts in Leviticus 23, and we're going to dig into, I'm going to spend some time digging into that Today And you're like, oh, yippee, we're going to spend some time in Leviticus today. Yes, yippee, because this matters to us and this really should encourage us because what we see is that, well, God says through the prophet Amos, he says that God always reveals his plans through prophecy. Uh, here, here's uh, Amos 3.7, says, surely, <coughs> excuse me, the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals to his servant, he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So throughout the Bible, what does that mean? It means that God provides a picture of his entire plan for mankind. And we see this prophetically foretold by God, pictured by God, and then we see it work itself out, and it's just one of those things where it's astounding to see how, how God moves and works. And one of the most clear prophetic pictures is outlined for us in the Jewish feasts of Leviticus 23. So altogether, there are seven feasts that, that uh, Leviticus 23 outlines. Uh, those seven are these, and we're going to go through them one by one. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and seventhly, the Feast of Booths. Now, the idea of the Hebrew word for feasts uh, literally means an appointed time. Um, and so the, the, what we see is that these seven annual feasts of Israel were actually appointed times by God uh, to point to a very specific part of his heavenly time time clock of his of of the 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 events that are going to play out in human history, and they're spread out over seven months of the Jewish calendar, uh, with seven being the number of perfection or completion, right? And so God carefully planned and orchestrated the timing and the sequence of these seven annual feasts um, to reveal a special story to everyone who would place their faith in Jesus Christ. 
And so the first Jewish feast of Leviticus 23 that prophetically reveals the special story of Jesus is the feast of Passover. We see it in Leviticus 23 verse 5 where it tells us this, the Lord's Passover begins at sundown on the 14th day of the first month. Now this date is based on the Hebrew lunar calendar And it would fall sometime, depending on the lunar calendar, it would fall sometime either in late March, in the month of April, or in the month of early May. And it was designed to commemorate the events of Exodus chapter 12. Uh, Just a quick review, Exodus chapter 12 was that section when God wanted to set the Israelites free from their captivity in Egypt. And so he told Moses to go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart, kept saying no. God kept sending plagues uh, on the nation. And it finally culminated there in Exodus 12 with with God sending uh, the, the angel of death. And he had warned the Jews, and he basically said this. He said, look, an angel of death's coming. And, uh, and if you want to be spared from the angel of death, you need to take a, spotted, a spotless lamb, perfect lamb. You need to sacrifice that lamb and you need to affix the blood of that lamb on the doorpost of your house. And of course, all of this is looking ahead to the person and work of Jesus Christ, who is the, the, the lamb that was slain for us, who's, by whose blood, whose stripes we are healed Right? And so that's the whole idea there. Now, there's lots of New Testament scripture to support this. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Uh, Mark 14, 12 uh, tells us that Jesus was crucified during Passover. And uh, 1 Peter 1, 19 and Hebrews 4, 15 tells us that Jesus is that perfect lamb without blemish or defect. And and again, the idea is this, that just as the first Passover marked the Hebrews' release from Egyptian slavery, so too the death of Christ at the last Passover that Jesus celebrated marks our release from the slavery of sin. Paul said to the Romans, Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so we have the feast of Passover. Second feast uh, that prophetically reveals the special story of Jesus is the feast of unleavened bread. Uh, Leviticus 23, verse 6 says, On the next day, the 15th day of the month, you must begin by celebrating the festival of unleavened bread. This festival to the Lord continues for seven days, and during that time, the bread, here it is, the bread you eat must be made without. Yeast. Now, in the Bible, yeast, also referred to as leaven, it, it is a picture of sin. How so? Well, well you take that, that leaven, you take that yeast, and you put it in a lump of dough, and what does it do? It rots the dough. And as it rots the dough, what happens is that, that there's a, there are gases that are released within the dough, and as those gases are released, It causes the dough to rise. This is how we get bread that we love so much. You cut into it, it's got all those little nooks and crannies. Those are just broken gas bubbles, those little divots in your bread. And then you toast it up and you slather your butter and it goes in all those nooks and crannies. And it tastes so wonderful, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It's just so amazing, right? I, I mean, my, my perfect picture of retirement is like maybe I get a side job driving a bread truck. And, and, <laughs> I mean, because how, you know, borrowing, you know, another pastor used this illustration and I latched onto it and said, Dad, that's brilliant. He's like, how bad could it be? You drive a bread truck all day. What's the worst that can happen? You know, you crash the truck. Oh, you spill the bread all out. Got to bake some more bread, you know, kind of thing. It's a picture of sin, man, that, that you know, here's, here's this bread and all of these, you know, these gas bubbles. It makes it taste so sweet and so good and so amazing, And I'm acutely aware of this. My last name is Leavenworth, and it's spelled just the same way. (laughs) L-E-A-V-E-N. And and that's me, apart from Christ. I'm just full of sin, right? And my worth comes from Jesus Christ, right? So so Leavenworth, right? And, And so this Feast of Unleavened Bread, what's it do? It points to the New Testament. It points to the Messiah's sinless life, 
right? That, that, uh, that Jesus, and by the way, it's an amazing thing to consider. Jesus' body was in the grave during the first days of this feast of unleavened bread. That like a kernel of wheat planted in the ground waiting to burst forth as the bread of life. Jesus, uh, our perfect sacrifice who was without sin, right? Okay, the third feast, Jewish feast of Leviticus 23 that prophetically reveals the special story of Jesus is the feast of first fruits. Uh, here, here it is in Leviticus. When you enter the land, God said that I'm giving you and you harvest its first crops, bring the priest a bundle of grain from the first cutting of your grain harvest and on the day after the Sabbath, the, the, the priest will lift it up before the Lord so that it may be accepted on your behalf. And again, in the New Testament, what's this pointing to? It's pointing to Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits of the righteous, right? Uh, writing to the Corinthians, Paul said, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And, and so, and by the way, when Jesus was resurrected, happened on this very day, the prophetic uh, calendar, and so that's the third feast. The fourth feast of Leviticus 23 that prophetically reveals the special story of Jesus is the feast we read about here in Acts chapter 2. It's the Feast of Pentecost, right? <coughs> um, this occurred 50 days after the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That, in fact, that's what Pentecost means. It means 50 days, right? And, and here's, here's how it reads out in Leviticus 23. From the day after the Sabbath... Uh, the day you bring the bundle of grain to be lifted up as a special offering, count off seven full weeks, keep counting until the day after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days later, then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. And what Pentecost does is it points to the gift of the Holy Spirit, to the great harvest of souls that are, that are going to be one, both Jew uh, and Gentile, means even more than that. We're going to dig into that, um, you know, how, how God's going to bring this great harvest. In fact, uh, we, we will read more about it next week. And spoiler alert, what we're going to see is that Peter, under the influence and power of the Holy Spirit, he's going to preach this powerful message. We're going to see 3,000 people come to a saving faith in Jesus um, just as the church is miraculously born and the Holy Spirit is poured out. Um, and so what we see here, just in this, in this quick review of Leviticus 23, is that four of the seven Jewish feasts have been completed, prophetically speaking. The Feast of Passover, where Jesus is our Passover lamb slain for us, it's been completed, literally. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's, it's that, that prophecy is, is completed in the person work of Christ. Secondly, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Jesus is our unleavened bread, our sinless lamb, uh, perfect sacrifice, uh, completed in the personal work of Christ. Third feast, the, the feast of first fruits, hey, it's been completed. Jesus has been raised to life um, and as the first fruits of all who are going to believe. And fourthly, this feast of Pentecost, we're reading about in Acts chapter 2, where Jesus has sent his promised Holy Spirit to bring a great harvest of souls. Now, like I said, we're going to come right back to this, but there's seven feasts, uh, just for the sake of, of completing this, l let's just go through all the feasts, and then I'm going to come back and dig into this Feast of Pentecost. So the fifth feast hasn't been completed yet. It's on God's prophetic calendar. This is the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, Leviticus 23, verses 24 and 25 says this. God says, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. On the first day of the appointed month, uh, in early autumn, you are to observe a day of complete rest. It will be an official day for holy assembly, a day commemorated with loud blasts of a trumpet. That's significant. You must not do ordinary, no ordinary work on that day. Instead, you are to present special gifts to the Lord. This feast is the first of three fall feasts, and these feasts have not yet prophetically been Completed. They are yet to come. The Feast of Trumpets <coughs> in the New Testament looks to the rapture of the church. Uh, when the Messiah will appear in the heavens as he comes for his bride, 
uh, the church. Why? Because rapture is always associated in Scripture with the blowing of a loud trumpet. I'll give you two verses to, to back that up. 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We'll put this on a sticker on the, the diapers that we change in the nursery over there for the kids, right? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twink, some of you just getting that. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Again, writing to the Thessalonians, Paul said this, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, uh, raptus in, in, uh, in uh, the uh, Latin language there. Uh, this is where we get the word rapture from. We shall be caught up uh, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. That's the fifth Jewish feast. The sixth Jewish feast of Leviticus 23 that prophetically reveals the story of Jesus is the day of atonement. This was the most solemn day uh, in all the Israelite feasts, and it was on this day that the high priest was to perform elaborate rituals to atone for the sins of of the people, here's, here's, uh, here is it detailed in Leviticus. Uh, God says, be very careful to celebrate the day of atonement on the 10th day of that same month, nine days after the festival of trumpets. Uh, you must observe it as an official day for holy assembly, uh, a day to deny yourselves and to present special gifts to the Lord. Do no work during that entire day because it is the day of atonement when offerings of purification are made for you, making you right with the Lord your God. This prophetically is looking forward in, 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 its, in its prophetic fulfillment to the second coming of Jesus when he's gonna return to the earth. This is the day that the Jews are gonna look upon him who they have pierced and repent of their sins and receive Jesus as their uh, Messiah. Zechariah said this, then they, then they will look on me whom they pierced Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves a firstborn. That's the sixth feast, seventh Jewish feast of Leviticus 23 that prophetically reveals the story of Jesus is the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, here it is, uh, Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 33. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel Begin celebrating the festival of shelters or tabernacles on the 15th day of the appointed month, five days after the day of atonement. This festival to the Lord will last for seven days. And what does this feast represent? Well, it looks forward, it points to the Lord's promise that he will once again tabernacle or dwell with his people when he returns to reign over the world. And so all together we have these seven Jewish feasts. We have four that occur in the spring and we have three that occur in the fall. And the four that occur in the spring were prophetically fulfilled and get this, every one of them was fulfilled right on the actual day in connection with Christ's first coming. And so what does that tell us? Well, there's many who believe and I would be among them that the three fall feasts who have yet to be prophetically fulfilled, that they will likewise be fulfilled, like you can take it to the bank, and that they're gonna be fulfilled literally on the exact day uh, of, of those, those feasts. All right, that brings us back here to the story uh, in Acts, in Acts chapter two. And for review, and I'll put this on the screen for you, we see that prophetically speaking, four of the seven feasts have now been completed. The Passover, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's slain for us. That's been completed prophetically. Secondly, unleavened bread. Jesus is our sinless bread of life. Uh, sinless, perfect sacrifice that's been fulfill fulfilled. Thirdly, first fruits. Jesus has been raised to life as the first fruits of all who will believe. That's been fulfilled. And fourth, in what we study here, Pentecost, Jesus has sent his promised Holy Spirit to bring a great harvest of souls. All right, let's dig into the events now of this 
prophetic fulfillment. What does it mean there in verse one that the day of Pentecost had fully come? Well, understand, it is now, as we're reading this chronologically, putting ourselves there uh, in the moment with the apostles, it is now 10 days after Jesus had ascended into heaven, right? Acts chapter one, verse three. He ascended into heaven. And that was on top of the 40 days that Acts chapter one, verse three says that he had spent with his disciples. You don't have to be a math major. 40 plus 10 is 50, right? Pentecost literally means 50 days. And so fully completed, it's 50 full days. And in Jewish tradition, Pentecost is also known as the Feast of Weeks because it's celebrated seven weeks after the Passover. Now, the reason that Pentecost was celebrated in the Old Testament is a couple of reasons. First, because it commemorated the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And secondly, because Jewish tradition also taught that Pentecost marked the day when God gave the, ten, gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai, right? And, and in fact, the Jews sometimes called Pentecost the season of the giving of the law. And, and so the, the, the Pentecost, Pentecost points to the New Testament church in a couple of amazing ways. You think about the first fruits of wheat harvest. Well, what do we have here? What we have is God giving his promised Holy Spirit to the disciples who are continuing the work that Jesus began, right, in the Gospels. And what we're seeing here is the birth of the church and a harvest, great harvest of many souls. So we're seeing that literal fulfillment of that in New Testament speaking. But we're also seeing, you know, as they, they celebrated, the Jews celebrated this as the time when the law was given, well, we see now what's given to us is, is yes, it's the word of God, but it's, it's the grace of God that is given to us. When God gave his, his law, the Bible tells us that the, that the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, right? And when it says that, it's, it, the, the, the actual language, the, the word is paedagogos, uh, and I think it's in the book of Galatians where, where, uh, where Paul talks about this. A Pythagogos was a tutor that was a really not, not, every Jewish boy knew who the Pythagogos was. This was the one that hit you, you, you wrapped your knuckles with the ruler, right, you know, kind of deal. Uh, Pythagogos was tough. Uh, and Paul says that was the law. The law was this, you know, wrap your knuckles kind of, you know, thing to where you realized, wow, this is, yeah, this is impossible. Like, how am, how am I going to do this? Well, Paul says it's a tutor to bring you to Christ to where you go to the, the place and you realize God's standard and you're like, God, I, you know, who's gonna save me from this body of death? Oh, it's Jesus. It points us to, the, to, the, to the Jesus who came in grace, fullness of grace and truth. And so, so we see that, that in the New Testament church, Pentecost is the celebration, the giving of God's word and it's the celebration of harvest. Now, we're going to unpack that in just a minute, but, but I want to look at real quickly the role of the Holy Spirit in both of those activities. Look again at verses two through four. It says, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they uh, were sitting. You see here a picture of power. Uh, and then, verse three, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. The picture here is of purity. We'll unpack both of those uh, concepts. And then verse four says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's the point. They began to speak with, with, uh, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And if you skip down to verse four, you hear what they were speaking. Uh, they said, we hear the people say, we hear them speaking in our own tongues. Here it is, the wonderful works of God, so, so you have power revealed here, you have purity revealed here, and the wonderful works of God, what do you have? You have promise that's, that's, that's revealed here. See, the, the sound of wind was symbolic of power, um, and, and there's lots of symbolism of that in God's word. In fact, uh, in, in Hebrew and in Greek, uh, for that matter, also in Latin, the word for spirit 
is the same word that's used for breath or for wind. Uh, Genesis 1, uh, verses 1 and 2, we see the Spirit of God as the breath and the wind of God blowing over the waters of the newly created earth. In Genesis 2, verse 7, it's the Spirit of God as the breath or the wind of God blowing life into newly created man. God made a mud pie, Adam, and then breathed life into him, right? Uh, In Ezekiel 37, verses 9 and 10, What is it? It's the Spirit of God (coughs) as the breath or the wind of God that's moving over the dry bones of Israel and bringing them life and strength. And so the sound of this wind would likely make these men and women, these 120 men and women uh, who knew the Hebrew Scriptures, it, it would make them think of the presence and the promise and the power of God's Holy Spirit that had been promised to them. And as well, then what do we read about? We read about these divided tongues as of fire there in verse three. And this would symbolize purification. You know, just as the refiner used fire to purify gold uh, or to burn away chaff, right? And and this this is the picture here. Zechariah prophesied about this, looking to a time when God would purify the remnant of Israel. Zechariah 13, 9, he said, I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. I'll refine them like silver and purify them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say, these are my people and they will say, the Lord is our God. So these tongues of fire, and by the way, this connects as well with John the Baptist's prophecy in Matthew chapter 3 where he said that Jesus would purify, would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Here's the scripture. I indeed baptize you, John the Baptist told the people, with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So here you have the prophetic fulfillment of Pentecost, and you have the promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it's all pointing to the New Testament church in two key ways. First of all, Pentecost was a celebration, as I said, of the giving of God's word. Jesus had promised his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 13, he said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And it's no coincidence here in Acts chapter 2 that the giving out of God's word is exactly and precisely what happens here. The the Holy Spirit fills these disciples, and notice there in verse 4, what happened? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and what's the result? They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, at this point, let me clarify a couple of things. How were they speaking, and and what were they speaking? First of all, how were they speaking? We see it in verse 4. It says that there that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak, here it is, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now that phrase, other tongues, uh, other tongues, uh, in the Greek, it, it's, uh, it's glossa. That's how, that's how you pronounce it in the Greek, glossa. And literally what it means is it's a language used by a particular people that is distinct from other nations. So, so, It's a particular language that they're given here, and it's an earthly language. It's it's a specific language of specific people, and as we're going to see as we continue, it's the specific language of those multitudes because everybody had gathered for the feast, right? And and so the Feast of Pentecost, you've got people gathered from all of these different regions. They all speak different languages, and they all have different dialects, and that's the next thing to see. Um, Verse 8 says that uh, they were also speaking various languages, but the word used there is the Greek word that we get the word dialects from. Um, And so the text reveals not only were these people speaking the native language of everyone gathered for the feast, but they're also speaking their actual dialect uh, uh, of of everyone who is uh, gathered. If you go to Ireland as an example, 
um, and you, you talk to somebody in the north, they have a very different dialect than the people have in the south. South is a very sing-songy kind of way that their, their accent sounds. In the north, uh, it's, it's uh, I, I don't know if guttural would be the right way to, to, to phrase it, but it's just, a, you can tell, you can hear that there's a different dialect. And, and here's the significance of that. Look at verse five. It says, they were, uh, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation uh, under heaven. And when this sound occurred, um, the multitude came together. What's the sound? The sound is this great rushing wind, right? So, so this, this caused everybody uh, to come together, and they're confused, it says, because everyone heard them. Who's the them? It's the 120 disciples now who are all filled with the Spirit, and they're all speaking different languages and different dialects. And so they're confused because they heard them speak in his own language, in his own dialect. And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? This is not unlike, I was showing my, my folks uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Justin Alfred attends our church, he's a southern man if you've met him, Th- you know, thick southern drawl, he, he sounds like foghorn leghorn, you know, when he talks, and yet he, he, he speaks uh, Greek uh, and Hebrew fluently, and he's the voice on Blue Letter Bible, and it's so crazy, you, you know, you hear the southern man talk, but then all of a sudden he pronounces a Greek word, or he pronounces a Hebrew word, and, it, and it's completely a different pronunciation. It just, it just is weird. It's weird. Here's this guy, and it comes across in a completely different voice. This is, this is what these guys are doing. They're like, these are Galileans, but they're speaking my language, and they're speaking it perfectly, right? And, and then they say, uh, who, 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 uh, who, what are they speaking? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues, our own language, and what are they saying, what are they speaking about? They're speaking about the wonderful works of God. And so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean, right? They're just like, they're like, wow, this is, this is amazing. And so how they're speaking uh, is supernaturally in, uh, in a language and in a dialect of those gathered. Now, what, what is it they, they were speaking? We see that in verse 11. They were speaking the wonderful works of God. So we see here this important principle, that as the disciples are empowered by the Holy Spirit, they are uniquely empowered to proclaim God's word in a way that glorifies him and also in a way that the hearers can comprehend, right? Now, this is an unusual work. Uh, And it's a work that's happening for a very specific purpose. All of these different people are gathered. This is one of, this is a sign so that all of those gathered can actually hear the gospel and they can have the opportunity to respond to this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so this is a unique work that God is doing. Now, having said that, I have heard of instances on the mission field where things like this have taken place where you have someone, a missionary in a particular location that does not speak the native language, has never learned the native language, and all of a sudden, supernaturally, they are gifted by God to actually speak in the native tongue of the people who are there, and it's had dramatic effect. But, but I'll tell you that um, in, a, in, a, in a more common everyday sense, uh, practically speaking, we see many Christians today who are likewise uniquely empowered by the Spirit to proclaim God's word in a way that glorifies him, but also in a way that the hearers can comprehend, but, but not necessarily in this supernatural way. I'll give you an example. Um, sometimes through our natural language and sometimes through our, our dialect, um, we can, you know, air quotes, speak somebody's language. 
right? I, I, for years, I, I was in the fire department as a paramedic firefighter, and, and I've noticed that in the years that have followed, just being part of that unique culture, I've had the opportunity to be able to witness to, to you know, unsaved firefighters because I speak their language. I get their culture, right? Maybe you've experienced the same thing to where, to where you understand a language and a culture uh, within the context of, of your uh, traveling. And the key is that it's just spirit-led. That, that we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit and we're ready to speak out and to glorify God in language that people can hear, right? And that's this beautiful thing. And so the first key way that Pentecost points to the New Testament church is that it was this celebration of the giving of God's word, right? The second key way, and we'll close on this, that, that Pentecost points to the New Testament church is that it's a celebration of harvest. It's a celebration of harvest. Uh, next week, we're going we're gonna to focus more on the result of this unique outpouring of the Spirit and Peter's preaching the message. We're going to see 3,000 people come to a saving faith in, in Jesus Christ. And with that in mind, you know, I've been pointing out to you Leviticus 23 and the sig- significance of the symbolism there. I, I, I want you to hear again the instructions for the celebration of Pentecost. Uh, notice this, uh, Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 17. God says, you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days uh, to, uh, to the day after the, the seventh Sabbath, and then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two loaves, two wave loaves, that waves mean you're gonna wave them before the Lord, two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah, they shall be, listen to this, of fine flour, they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. They're baked with leaven. What is the significance of that? You've got, because we know leaven is symbolic of sin, so what am I, I'm supposed to have two loaves of bread that are filled with sin that, that I present to the Lord as, as this, this, this wave offering. Like, what on earth is this, this Pentecost offering? Here's what it is. The two loaves represent Jew and Gentile. It represents those that God wanted to reach, to rescue, and to redeem. Listen, you are a sinner by nature and by choice. You are filled with leaven. Sorry to tell you, I'm not the only leaven one here, right? Leaven, right? But your worth is in Christ. And the thing is, is that we come to the Lord and we see Pentecost and it is a celebration of a great harvest. Why? Because God is so good. And we as sinners by nature and choice, we can come to a holy God and we can find in the person and the work of Jesus our cleansing and our redemption and our purification. And I don't care who you are here today. Listen, Satan will lie to you and he'll tell you, hey, you know what? You might as well just give up because, because you're such a loser. You're, you're just such a blow it. Or even worse, what will happen is he'll say, hey, you, you need to do a lot of work. Get right with God. And there's a lot of people that buy into that lie. And it's like, man, I gotta do good. I gotta try harder. I gotta help more old ladies across the street. I gotta do something to earn my right way with God. Listen, you will never do that because the Bible says that that you are all sinners and that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Right? God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. This beautiful outworking of Pentecost here, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and you and me can know Jesus and walk with Jesus. That is our great hope, this great harvest of of God. I'm gonna close with three questions, and we're gonna pray. Question number one, how is the truth that all sinners can be part of God's great harvest specifically impacted my life? 
I'm gonna come back to that. So third, secondly, how can I proclaim God's word in a way that glorifies him and that hearers can comprehend? And our third question to take a walk with this week, what are some ways that the imminent return of Christ can and should inform how I'm living for God today. The idea behind this question is that four of the feasts have been fulfilled. There are three yet remaining, and, the, and they'll probably be fulfilled, just one right in order, and then the very next one, the rapture of the church, Jesus coming back for his church. Are you ready? Are you ready? This first question, how is the truth that all sinners can be part of a great harvest specifically impacted my life? I just wanna ask you as we close in prayer, do you know the Lord Jesus? Have you invited him to be your Lord and Savior?